Ed? Yes. Can you can hear me? Hi, can you hear me? Can you hear both of us? Hello and welcome to the Bitcoin Show. What are we at? Hello. Episode uh, three, episode four, five, episode six. six. Oh my gosh, we're at episode six already. And uh, I'm Bruce Wagner. And I'm Ed Gell. And uh, welcome. There's all kinds of breaking news in the Bitcoin world and uh, we want to bring it to you and uh, get as much information as we can to you as quickly as we can. So, um, <clears throat> as I say, there's a lot going on. I'm going to bring up the, uh, well first of all, let me just say this. Today's episode of The Bitcoin Show is brought to you by our awesome sponsors. First, Ambivert Creative. Ambivert Creative is A-M-B-I-V-E-R-T creative.com. They create your corporate identity. And bitcoinbonus.com. Bitcoinbonus.com. They're amazing. You'll get paid back in bitcoins for everything you do. Everything you shop online, everything you buy and sign up for that you're doing anyway, you get paid back. And Blue Canary Nightlight. Blue Canary Nightlight.com. They sell the most amazing Blue Canary light, Nightlight. Check it out. Uh, just take a look at it and read the story behind it, and you'll be hooked. You got to buy one. All right. And TradeHill.com, which is the uh, new exchange site on the scene, new kids on the block, and uh, awesome new features and so on. Uh, you can actually get a 10% discount for all your trades for life with views, the referral code on your screen, which is TH as in TradeHill, dash R as in referral code. 141. That's TH R 141. So thank you guys for sponsoring the Bitcoin show. We're always looking for new sponsors and uh, we really appreciate you. Yes, so thank you. <coughs> today we have uh, live via Skype Kevin Day. You don't know Kevin, probably. Say hello, <laughs> unless Kevin. You, unless you happen to be Hi, married buddy. to him. Thanks for having me on today. But Kevin has a, uh, a story to tell. Um, so why don't I just, let's just go into it, Kevin, and why don't you tell us, tell us the story from the beginning. Well, I've been playing on the Bitcoin market for quite a while now, and I've been using Mt. Gox trade funds for, you know, the last couple of months, like a lot of people here, I think, have been. And I was a witness to the event that happened yesterday where somebody with a large quantity of Bitcoins decided to sell all of them at a penny, which instantly crashed the market. And... You know, because every sell has to be matched up with a buy, somebody was the one who bought all those coins for a penny, and that somebody just happened to be me. Um, yesterday, just through pretty much good timing, 
I bought roughly five million dollars worth of bitcoins for three thousand dollars. Wow. Five thousand dollars. Five thousand dollars worth. Five million dollars worth of bitcoins for about three thousand dollars. Five million dollars worth. Now, when you say five million dollars worth of Bitcoin, how are you determining? Like, how many Bitcoins is that? Um, I ended up with two hundred and fifty-nine thousand Bitcoins, um, and at yesterday's prices, before everything crashed, that would have been roughly, you know, around five million dollars. Five million dollars. At what what price? I mean, I mean, what price is that? Would that be five million dollars? That would be at seventeen fifty. Seventeen fifty. That's about right. Yeah. Which was where it, things were before it, it all fell apart. What it should have been. Wow. Okay. So, uh, how do you think this happened, and what's going on now? Well, it looks like. I mean, I, there's a lot of, of guessing going on right now, and there hasn't been a lot of really official statements as to what really did happen. But it looks like somebody was able to penetrate one or more accounts on Mount Gox that had significant funds of Bitcoin stored. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting security features that Mt. Gox has is that you're not allowed to withdraw more than $1,000 of Bitcoin at whatever the current market value is per day, sort of a safety feature. So you know, if you have millions of dollars in Bitcoins in there, it's supposed to be safe. You know, no one can take more than a thousand dollars at a time unless you've gone and emailed them, proved who you are, and said, you know, you basically are taking responsibility for what happened. Mm -hmm. And I think some smart guy realized that if he crashes the market, so bitcoins are worth less than a penny apiece, he could withdraw whatever he wanted. Right. And I'm guessing. I mean, this is pure speculation, but that's the only reason why I think somebody did this was they were planning on crashing the market and then cashing out as quickly as they could. Hopefully, buying them all back at a penny, which I think I beat them too. Mm -hmm. um, what what seemed to happen was we were all watching this this trade as it happened, where somebody put a gigantic sell order in, and you know the way a market like this works, there will be some people who are buying, some people who are selling, you know, and it keeps trying to match up the best prices for buyers as it went through the system. So it started out buying Bitcoins at $17, and then $15, and then $10. And this order, just one single order for so many Bitcoins, consumed every order on the system until it was just some people's hoping for a miracle um, orders for a penny a piece at all the way at the very bottom mm -hmm. that I just got a tiny bit on top of and beat everybody else with punch. Right. right. So you think that, um, OK, so the big question that every, a lot of people are asking is, was it just one account that was hacked and the Bitcoins were sold from, or did it, were a lot of people's Bitcoins sold? What do you, what do you think about that? It's, I, I really think it's going to be up to Mt. Gox to tell us what happened. They're saying only one account got hacked, which is plausible, but I think one of the questionable things is why would anyone store this amount of money on a public website, especially one that over the last few days has been getting a lot of flack for having security problems. You know, for, for several days now, people have been saying, here's a list of everyone's encrypted passwords. And the people from Mount Gox have been assuring everybody, no, everything's safe, don't worry about it. But I would think if I had, you know, it looks like the total amount that this account had in it before the attack right into it was somewhere in the order of $8 million worth at yesterday's prices. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's a little odd to, to try to think of why somebody would have that much money in one account at a time. Mm -hmm. um, but if what the Mt. Gox people are saying is true, it was one person who had all this. A hacker broke into it and was trying to find any way of getting that money out and basically crashed the market for everyone to be able to do so. And you're in Chicago, Illinois, right? Yes, I am. And how long have you been a, a customer of Mt. Gox? Um, I've been really you know, playing with it um, for probably a month or two now. Just a month or uh, two. Okay, and you, I mean, obviously this is the best deal you found, a penny. Yes, <laughs> what was the price going when you first got into it? Um, things, when I first started looking at it, were up in the $3 range, and then when I first actually decided I was going to play with this was in the $5 range. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I never <laughs> expected it to be less than a penny again. Now, a lot of people are saying that, that it was multiple accounts all triggered to sell at the same time. Are you, uh, I mean, do we have any way of knowing, really, you well, it, it, it would be difficult, I think, for that to happen because, for one, when we were watching the trades go through, you know, um, 
The way Mt. Gox handles trades is that they, one large trade will slowly eat up more and more buyers as it finds them. It's not an instant trade like what would be, a, say, like on a big stock market. It, it seems to be sort of paced. Mm -hmm. And all of these trades were coming in with the exact same time on them, which got further and further in the past. Mm -hmm. So either someone timed them to the very second to all go off at once, or they all were in one account. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. So... Um, and well, they could have been, couldn't they have been all triggered at the same time, to go off at the same time? Sorry, I didn't catch that. Couldn't they all uh, have been triggered to go off at the same time? It is possible, um, but one of the things that we actually noticed yesterday is that while one trade is executed, it's almost impossible to put in a new one. Mm -hmm. um, the system keeps saying, you know, there's a trade already in progress and it can't create a new one. So I don't know if that's an intentional limit of only allowing one trade to go through while one's processing, or if that was just a side effect of so many people panicking and hitting the refresh button on the browser so that it killed the site. But it was nearly impossible for anyone to execute trades until this finished. Right, okay. And you say that it took about 20 minutes for this whole, this whole event to, uh, I mean, for the whole trade, that one transaction to complete. That's just off the top of my head, but it, it felt around 20 minutes, yeah. I mean, we were watching, you know, the, it in real time and still seeing the same what appeared to be the same order still executing for far after you know everyone had already started panicking and wondering what was going on wow mm -hmm. all right so how how do you feel about the uh, suggestion of a rollback of all these transactions well i think all of you are going to think i'm really biased here in this um but i think a rollback is, is really pretty dangerous for a few reasons um the biggest is that up until now, the whole idea of a rollback was almost unheard of. You know, Mt. Gox had never said, hey, we reserve the right to roll back. If we feel like it, they've never published the policies where they do. You know, traditional stock markets have written, published policies where if there's some kind of obvious error or security incident or whatever, mm -hmm. here's what level it takes for the, these rules to kick in, and here's how we will handle it. There was none of that. And some of the language on the Mt. Gox website to some of us really made it seem like they were saying, we aren't interfering in any trade whatsoever. We're just matching up buyers and sellers. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a feeling, I guess, of a few, a few of us here that are saying, we don't know that they really should be allowed to do this because they made it sound like not only did they never mention this, but they hadn't. Uh, they had used language to make it, it sound like they thought they couldn't. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, so not the, that specific. there's a lot of things that are not very specific until after it's kind of too late. Right. Um, <clears throat> wow. So, all right. If uh, Do you think that you're the only one who benefited from this? Definitely not. I think I was probably the one who benefited the most. At least I got the biggest order in. Uh, but there were a lot of people who had standing orders for a very long time that basically told the system, you know, if the price ever drops below 10, buy me $1,000 worth. If the price right. ever drops below 5, buy me $10,000 worth, whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. And all of those orders from everyone who was pretty much willing to put their foot in the line before this happened got their orders filled. Mm -hmm. So there were quite a number of people, and again, it's kind of hard to rewind this now to figure out what happened while the site's still down. Mm -hmm. But... There have been quite a few people in IRC who have been saying, you know, they got trades in too, they got this happened, they got this happened. So it's it's hard to tell the scale or the scope unless they're going to be really transparent about which trades they're going to to revoke and why. Yeah. Right. And were you what, were you trying to withdraw that? Those or I well, what happened was when I placed this trade order, I was basically clicking over and over again and getting you know trades not be executed right now, and I didn't think any of them went through. Um, and then the whole site died for a few seconds. I refreshed, I looked at my history, and I showed you know, that I had just bought more than 250,000 coins. And everybody in IRC was sort of talking about you know, what happened, why, you know, what's going on, combined with the fact that the, there was a lot of security concerns recently. I was, at, at the very least, had doubts whether the whole site had just been hacked and someone was trying to empty everything, not just one account, but the whole thing. So initially, I tried to withdraw a substantial portion of that just as, as for safekeeping, if nothing else. Mm -hmm. And that $1,000 limit kicked in and stopped me. I didn't get very much out at all. Um, mm -hmm. 
and decided at that point that even though there may have been some ways I could have evaded that and still went through the whole thing, I thought that would look very suspicious, mm -hmm. you know, and at, at, at best, I didn't want anyone to think I was responsible for the whole crash anyway, so I thought I should be, you know, not do anything even slightly shady, so I just left it all in there and untouched so that when calmer heads were around, we could figure out what happened. Right. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. When calmer heads prevail. Okay. I know there's a huge um, debate going on about rollback or don't rollback and all that. And uh, it's, <coughs> it's uh, very disconcerting because, I mean, obviously everyone's biased to one degree or another, I guess, unless they didn't have anything at all in, in Mt. Gox. But everyone either benefited or, or, well, I shouldn't say that. Not everybody benefited or lost. But um, a lot of people have um, strong opinions about it because they don't want their transactions to be reversed. You know, um, I think I kind of expected people to come down uh, kind of hard on, on you because that's what people do, especially in forums on the interwebs. But um, the, you know, obviously, you know, you got a $5 million worth of Bitcoin <laughs> for a penny apiece. I mean, who wouldn't like that? That would be a happy day. I guess you're probably jumping up and down around the house for a at least for a few minutes. <laughs> Ollie was near heart attack for a moment. Near heart attack. <laughs> yeah. But like, yeah, we no, won the lottery. It was, it was an interesting moment. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, one point I'd like to make, too, is that very few people, I think, have been negatively impacted by this in any way. Um, definitely whoever's account that these came out of, if, if what they're saying is true, it all came out of one account. Mm -hmm. That guy got a really rough deal with this. Right. And I think... Mount Gox is going to get a really rough deal because a lot of trust in them has been shattered and, you know, this is going to really affect their business, I think. But yeah. as for day-to-day -day people, the customers using the exchange, I don't think there are very many people who can say they actually were, well, because this happened. People who had orders to buy kick in had placed most of these orders well before this had happened and had already basically committed to buying at that price. And because the system was so overloaded, there were very few people even able to panic sell if they wanted to. Mm -hmm. So I think only the people who've really been substantially harmed in this, you know, where you have to point to a number and say, this is how many dollars this people, this person lost, was whoever's account had $8 million in it sitting there to start with, and how, what effect this is going to have on the Mt. Gox economy going forward. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow. Well, I think also, I mean, uh, specifically, I guess, like you're saying, maybe no one monetarily, but the whole community as a whole is being affected, obviously, because no one's, 90% of the trades are going through Mt. Gox, and uh, no one's able to do that right now. So it's Definitely. at a standstill. And what I think, one of the other issues that I think is being overlooked right now, regardless of how this affects me, if they're going to start setting a precedent where if they feel something improper happened without really having fixed policies that everyone can point to and go, yeah, I agreed to. It's going to make it very difficult for people to trust putting money, leaving money in their account there, which is going to really harm liquidity. You know, if, if I have to be panicked about, could a trade I just made that doubled my money get reversed an hour later, I'm going to pull my money out after every trade. Right. And if everybody is doing that and it takes so long to put money back in, Liquidity is really going to dry up on any exchange that doesn't have a policy of we won't do a, do a rollback unless X, Y, and Z happen and everyone agrees to begin with. Because if, if this is the norm and this is going to be the status quo going forward where they're going to arbitrarily reverse things with behind the scenes decisions happening and no one really knowing what's going on, personally, even if I was not involved in this, I don't know that I'd feel comfortable keeping my money in there anymore. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that. I don't, I don't think that would be the norm, but I, as anything in its infancy, it's going to, you know, take a lot of mental thought and, and people's uh, opinions and suggestions on what, you know, they should do going forward because no one really knows how, you know, how this is all going to play out and, and, and how it's affecting everyone else. So I guess it's just playing it by ear. Definitely, you know, and... I other questions have come up too, like, you know, where do they draw the line? If I have an account tomorrow that five Bitcoins get hacked from, are they going to revert for me because I lost five? You know, if not, where do they draw the line? You know, are they doing this because they're claiming some responsibility for what happened, not because it was my mistake? And if they were claiming responsibility for it, 
should they be forced to honor these trades then? Right. How would you feel if um, it had been the other way around? It, say you had five or ten million dollars in uh, in Mt. Gox uh, because you were doing a big trade or you were doing a trade over time and you had to have that, those dollars there, or those Bitcoin there, or you had made so much money, which is probably likely, you'd made so much money by the increase in the value and you're only able to get $1,000 a day out because you don't want to, um, you know, fax your ID to, um, to Mt. Gox. If you have all this wealth stored in there and you're whittling away trying to get it out and all of a sudden your account was hacked because you put your wife's name and birthday as your password, how would you feel today? What would you be saying today if that had been the other way around? I mean, I, I guess hindsight is, is a lot clearer than knowing what I do had this not happened. But to me, if I was dealing in highly convertible, very difficult to reverse currency, mm -hmm. I would not store it on a public website if I was dealing with $8 million worth. I don't care who was running it. You know, mm -hmm. One of the, the tenets of, of Bitcoin is that it's cryptographically secure. If I have Bitcoins in my wallet, Unless someone gets possession of my wallet file, they can't touch it. But if I'm storing bitcoins on a site like Mt. Gox, that's on a computer connected to the internet that's letting random people tell it to do things. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would ever put myself in that situation to begin with. I'm not saying it's this guy's fault, right. but even then, if I had to, I would have the most epic password you have ever seen if it was <laughs> what's standing between me and someone taking my $8 million. Right. Well, I mean, but on the other hand, you know, we have to remember that at Mt. Gox, you can only withdraw $1,000 a day and up to $10,000 a month anonymously. So a lot of people are kind of stuck in this trap of not uh, being able to get it out. You can get, you know, Bitcoins, you can transfer out any amount you want if mm. you ask them to. Well, you can really that, the Bitcoin transfer limit just by asking. Well, maybe, but that's not published and people don't know that. Well, no, I, I, I have... That was part of, I went through the, the procedure to have the cash withdrawal limit for myself raised because I was bumping into it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things he asked was, do you want to up your Bitcoin withdrawal limit as well? You can just tell me whatever you want to, to set that to and I'll do it. Right. And I know other big traders are doing the same thing as well where, you know, $1,000 worth of Bitcoin a day for people that are trading in massive amounts, that's nothing. Right. right. And, yeah. you know, I... Again, I, I can't speculate on, on what the intentions were of the person who had this account, but I'm definitely curious as to why. You know, I think I think I want to know that more than anything. Why did somebody have 500,000 plus bitcoins stored on a public website? Yeah, well, like I say, I know a lot of people who don't know that it's possible to, you know, send any, a personal email to. Um, you know, to Mark and ask him to raise that limit. I mean, it does, it's, a lot of these things are not on the website. They're not public. So they're just, just, all they do is try and it says, no, you can't. Well, if you try, it tells you to email them to have it raised. What happens when you try oh. to exceed that limit, it says, yeah. you have hit limit X. Please email this special address to ask to have it removed. When I did that, that to have my, my limit changed, I had an email back a couple hours later asking for photo ID and proof right. of access. Yes. Do you get an, uh, did and you get an email like that? And that, he mm -hmm. asked me where I wanted to change my limits to. Mm -hmm. So the way I found out from it was by hitting it. Right. Hmm, by hitting it. Oh, because, okay, are you sure that, because uh, we've hit that limit before, are you sure you're getting, you get an email saying that you can raise the limit? Oh, no, no, when you try to withdraw it, it tells you, send an email to this address, and then when you send right. the email, you get a response back, like what he oh, just said. Oh, okay, I got you. It, it, when you try to withdraw more than a certain amount, an email address appears and it tells you to email that address to have your limit changed. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, anyway, but I mean, if we assume that this is the case that the guy just didn't know, people are very busy and they, they you know, they barely know what's happening day to day. If he just, if he had it in there, he's busy and he, he, he ran into this thing and he got, oh, it's an email, I got to do something and he never got around to it. And he, you know, he trusts Mt. Gox. Mt. After all, it's the number one trade site. 90% of all the trades happen through Mt. Gox. Um, if he's trusting the site, he's got his money there, you know, maybe he, you know, a lot of people have their money in Mt. Gox and Trade Hill and uh, MyBitcoin.com and all these web-based, uh, cloud-based services, and they're just trusting that it's going to be there because everybody else has their money there. If, but if, if they, you know, if this is, by the way, what I tell you, the audience, if you have a password that's not secure and unique, you need to change it. Of course, you can't do it right now. The site's down. But on anything, whether it's my Bitcoin or, Mount, or Trade Hill or Mt. Gox or anything, you have to use a unique password. So um, 
Make sure that it's long and that it's unique. It should be like scrambled letters and numbers. I use this thing called KeyPass X. Is that what it's called? Yep. KeyPass X. It's free. It's free open source software. But uh, Google KeyPass X. K it's K E E P A S S X. All one word. And it's an awesome little. Uh, they're not a sponsor or anything, but it's an awesome little free tool that will organize all your passwords. But you must have a unique password for Mt. Gox. You have to have a unique password for Trade Hill. You have to have a unique password for your email. Everything needs to be unique and it needs to be long. At least 12 to 16 random letters and numbers. I have, uh, you can have it set to always include numbers, letters, you can make them lowercase. You can make them, uh, if you add one symbol, it makes it nearly unhackable, but I would say like 16 characters long. And this little tool will help you because you just click a button, copy it, paste it right in, and keep your passwords secure. But anybody who had a uh, password that they used on Mt. Gox that they also used on MyBitcoin, or their email or anything else, you're, you're probably already hacked. You've got to go in and change your password immediately and, and verify that. Google apparently knows, um, was made aware that this uh, email list with login IDs and passwords got uh, hacked and uh, disclosed on the internet. So they've already uh, forced a reset on everybody's Gmail account. I know I got that. When I went to log on, it said, you, you suspicious activity, uh, give us a new password. So right. that's a good thing that that's happening. Um, <clears throat> all right, now this is probably a good time to uh, take just a moment <laughs> again and thank our sponsors because without our sponsors, we wouldn't be here to tell you the story. And I got to tell you this, at 10 p.m. Eastern time tonight, which I think is 2 a.m., uh, uh, what is it, UC, UT, UTC, UTC, GM, GMT, <laughs> whatever it's called, 2 a.m. tomorrow, uh, GMT which is 10 p.m. Eastern time tonight, we're going to have Mark, uh, Mark, Cal how do you say Car his name? Carpellas. Mark Carpellas, who is the owner of Mount Gox, uh, on live with us here. So join us uh, live tonight at 10 p.m. Eastern and uh, for an hour, and we're going to chat with Mark directly, and you'll be able to ask your questions in the chat room, and uh, we will ask him on the air and hopefully get to the bottom of all these questions and conspiracy theories and so on. But <coughs> first, let me take a moment and thank Ambivert Creative. Ambivert Creative is, uh, it's A-M-B-I-V-E-R-T, ambivertcreative.com. They create your, your corporate identity. Um, you're a geek, you create this amazing website, product, service, whatever it is that you're selling, and you need a really cool looking logo and with colors and you know theme and style and all that, they will create your corporate identity, including your, your website, your logo, your business card, your stationery, your whole corporate identity. Ambivert Creative, they're awesome. Of course, they accept Bitcoin. Who doesn't, right? And Bitcoin Bonus. Bitcoin Bonus is amazing. Before they became a sponsor, I was getting people calling me, telling me, have you heard of this thing? Of course I've heard of it. Uh, my friend Daryl started it <laughs> in DC. It's an amazing little thing. It's called BitcoinBonus.com. All the shopping you do online, even if it's you know BestBuy.com, all the big, big name.coms, all the stuff you're buying anyway. Web hosting, I guarantee you, the stuff that you're buying right now is already there. You go there, click the link for it on BitcoinBonus.com, and you will get paid back in Bitcoin for just making the purchases you're gonna make anyway. So check out BitcoinBonus.com. Next, Blue Canary Nightlight. BlueCanaryNightlight.com. It's an amazing little thing. They sell one thing. It's a nightlight, but it's so cool. It's this beautiful little blue nightlight. Uh, it glows, kind of a blue, purplish blue color. And um, the, the, it's a, a really cool couple who created this thing for their daughter. And I, there's a song about it and so on. But anyway, um, check it out. You, you'll take one look at it and you'll fall in love with it. And you can buy it with a Bitcoin. So, oh, well, maybe more than one Bitcoin. Maybe less than one now. Anyway, uh, check it out, bluecanarynightlight.com. And finally, tradehill.com, of course. Trade Hill is the new kid on the block as far as um, online automated exchange sites. And uh, Trade Hill is awesome. They've got full featured, many, many currencies, many, many ways to get your money in, get your money out. Um, they don't have any limits on withdrawals. They have, um, what else, all kinds of new services that are coming soon, like options and so on. But also many ways to get it out and are coming where you can actually shop online. As I was saying, you can put in the product and buy from all these major dot coms with your bitcoins directly, all in one transaction. So check it out. And you get 10% off of all trades for life on tradehill.com if you use the referral code for the Bitcoin show, which is TH-R141. That's TH, like Trade Hill, dash R, as in referral code, 141. 
dh-r141. So thanks to our sponsors. If it weren't for them, we wouldn't be here. And um, so back to our questions. Um, <coughs> what do you got, Ed? Well, I, uh, a lot of people on the, on the chat room I'm reading are saying that by them, by Mount Gox rolling back, it, it's like the same as saying a bailout or fiat currency. Um, and, um, you know, I understand where they're coming from because of the bad taste in everyone's mouth with our current uh, financial system. But um, I, I don't know what's fair and I don't know the whole story. So I'm deferring my, my true opinion until I know the whole story because I always think there's like three or four sides to each story. And, um, and so uh, do you think the same way that it's rolling back is, is really not the president? I think you might have mentioned that before, right? Um, I guess one of the concerns I have with this now too is, is basically that. It's if, if we're allowing this third party to exhibit more control over the whole Bitcoin economy than we originally thought they had, that really changes the dynamics of, of everything here. You know, how, how much that affects things, I have no idea. I don't think anyone's gonna be able to tell us that until the market's reopened. But, you know, giving uh, a significant control of who is allowed to have what trades occur to a third party does change the dynamics. I, I, I you know, I can't tell you what, what effect that will have. Yeah, well I know that in like the New York Stock Exchange, this is, I don't know how common it is, but it's not uncommon for them to roll back, uh, you know, trades because by the time they figure out that there was a mistake, then they have to do that. There's no real other way to do it. So it's not perfect, but it's maybe the best way. One yeah. of the analogies that I've read is, you know, if somebody, uh, you know, breaks into someone's house and they steal a bunch of uh, jewelry or something, and then they go and, um, you know, sell it and they set up a you know whatever they sell it on craigslist and you happen to be the lucky buyer who buys this jewelry at a bargain it's not really a defense that well this was a fair transaction because it's considered stolen goods obviously it's really easy to identify that that happened and so if you're possessing stolen goods even if you did buy it um it's uh you don't get to keep it they you know, you may not even get your money back, but they will confiscate the stolen goods. Do you, would you consider, I mean, do you think that's a valid argument to say, you bought these fair and square on the exchange site, but you actually bought it from the a criminal who hacked into somebody's account. So basically someone stole those Bitcoins and then sold them to you. Because the, the owner didn't sell them to you, somebody else, the, thie the, the criminal, the thief stole them to, to you. So would you consider that stolen goods? That, that's a really complicated question. Um, mm -hmm. And I have had so many armchair lawyers and real lawyers been trying to give me advice for the last few days as to <laughs> exactly the answer to that question. And the answer is, I don't know. Um, there are some who definitely believe that this is, would be considered stolen goods. And there are some who believe that this isn't a case of anything being stolen. It is just that Mt. Gox sold me bitcoins that they didn't have a buyer or a seller that was wanting to sell those. So they made a sale to me that, that they didn't have a, a, a you know, it wasn't backed by a legitimate order from somebody else and I accept you know they, I accepted the trade and they are responsible for that mm -hmm. whether that's true or not true I have no idea um, and going back to like the, the first part of your question too you know I know on, on big you know real world kind of stock exchanges there are rollbacks and broken trades and things like that happen constantly. You know, some, some traders say that a significant portion of every trade they make gets rolled back because of some error here or there. And in principle, I'm completely okay with the idea of things being rolled back. What I'm, I'm not okay with is for things to be rolled back with no clear policy as to why, and not even the understanding that everyone went into with it that rollbacks were going to even be a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, right. So, you know, it's kind of, kind of a two-part answer there, but... I think a lot of things are, we didn't know are a possibility are happening because this used to be just a penny little game. It was almost, exactly. almost it was an experimental, uh, almost like a video game, a multiplayer game uh, for pennies. And uh, it was just, we were just playing. 
uh, with play money, you know, at liter literally pocket change. And now suddenly it's a multi-million dollar market and it's real serious money. And all of us, and I mean, we're getting what we asked for. It's unregulated, it's decentralized, there's no authority. So it's kind of like the wild, wild west. It's really buyer beware. I get questions exactly. constantly. And, you know, I think we're kind of torn in between wanting some of the same real world protections that we have for tangible goods in real life or traditional stock exchanges or markets. But at the same time, we're still wanting the other side of the coin where we have the unregulated mess that we also want. And mm -hmm. where we decide to make that line come down is going to, I think, dictate the future of Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, um, for those people who are just arriving late, um, we're, we're speaking to Kevin Day, who's uh, live with us via Skype from Chicago, Illinois. Kevin is the, the gentleman who just happened to click buy at the right time and uh, won the lottery, the Bitcoin lottery on Mt. Gox. He actually bought um, basically at the going rate at the time, 17 something, 1750 something, he bought the equivalent of $5 million worth of Bitcoin for a penny a piece. And um, he is not in favor of a rollback. <laughs> Who would be? But um, I think you understand that, um, you know, that it, I, I think you kind of see both sides. Like you, you feel like, um, tell me if I'm wrong, but tell me if I'm expressing your sentiment correctly, that you feel that um, you understand that you don't expect to keep $5 million worth of Bitcoin maybe, but you feel like this really wasn't fair to you either. Even though, I mean, t to, be, to be able to make this purchase and then have it like, oh, never mind, you're, you're losing, the whole Bitcoin community is gonna lose a lot of trust in exchanges if this can just happen on a whim. You purchase and you get a good deal. I mean, you, it goes, Bitcoin drops to $10 and you buy a whole bunch, and then a day later they say, oh, oops, we made a mistake. We're going to restore from the backups, and oh, and you don't have any Bitcoin. That, you know, that right? I mean, if, if there was a clear line that someone had given out before this point that said, you know, here's where we will do rollbacks, I would have no problem with it. You know, I'd either agree with that and use Mt. Gox, or I would disagree with that and go somewhere else. Um, the, the issue that I think a, a lot of people are having right now is just the, the uncertainty that this has added. Everyone just, I think, before this point assumed you execute a trade, the trade is done. There is no going back, there's no, you know, and it, it's a, a little weird in that the, the scenario they're trying to play out now with the rollback, the buyer is basically going to get most, if not all, of everything they had back. Mt. Gox is going to have pretty much very little in the way of responsibility for this. The only people who are going to come away from this negatively were the people who had buy orders executed that got canceled. And there are probably a lot of you out there saying, well, that's how it should be. And if that's all what we had agreed to to begin with, then I would be completely okay with that. What I'm, you know, what I, I don't like, I guess, is the, the uncertainty factor this has thrown into everything now. You know, am I gonna have to wait 10 days before I spend any Bitcoins, before I spend them? Am I have to wait a day, an hour? You know, where did that line just get moved? Right. Let me ask you, a lot of people are asking this. I know that you already told me this, but for the audience, after this trade happened, how many Bitcoins or dollars did you withdraw? I got 643 Bitcoins withdrew that I am holding on to and not touching until we decide what's going to happen with any of this. But I ended up with 643, um, which I think is one other point I, I was hoping to make publicly here too was that some of the statements that Mt. Gox has been making about exactly what has happened to this, while I'm not at all implying they're not being truthful, I don't know that they're explaining it in a way that people are understanding what happened. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the statement that's been on the Mt. Gox website since this happened has said, you know, the, the hacker is the one who compromised an account, sold all the Bitcoins, bought them all again, and then tried to withdraw them. And while I don't know that this is what they intended to say, I think anybody who reads that sentence is going to think that this hacker is the one who made this gigantic buy, not me. Right. And that's how they are justifying doing the rollback, is that that's the only way they can prevent this hacker from benefiting from this. Well, unless you are the hacker, then that's very right. misleading, <laughs> right? right? To know, say the least. There are probably people thinking that too. But, uh, <laughs> I, I'm here showing my face, showing my name. Well, maybe it's true what they say. This really is the world's stupidest hacker. You're getting on television and telling, telling the world you did this. But you didn't do this. We'll make it clear. You didn't do this, right? I did not do this. No. I, okay. I had nothing to do with the, the <laughs> I, I just got lucky in pressing, you know, 
that's the best day. That's all I did. I, I was lucky timing. I had nothing to do with crash. And okay. you know, the, one of the points I'd like to make too was I could have caused another crash if I really wanted to withdraw this whole thing. You could have. After the crash happened, there was only like maybe a hundred bitcoins that I needed to, to sell at a humongous loss to crash the market again, and then I would have been well under the one thousand dollar with a day limit, and I could have taken the whole thing out. And mm -hmm. I didn't do that. Why? Why didn't you do that? I just. To be honest, I thought that if, if I did that, for one, nobody would believe me I wasn't responsible for it. Mm. And second, I was really worried about what effect that would have on the whole community. I have a stake in all of this too. And I was, you know, honestly could not predict what that would happen and was pretty much going to defer to the Mount Fox people for how to proceed, never assuming that this was going to be one of their possibilities they were going to go forward with. Wow, your your brain must have been like smoking, all these thoughts spinning around in your mind, and you and um, you talk it over with your family. And th did you ask them what they think, or did you do this all on your own? It was all pretty much happening too quickly to really do anything. You know, mm -hmm. it was one of those we didn't know where it was going to stop or how long it was going to take, and we all were just sort of watching what was happening, going, uh, "If we're going to do something, let's do it quick." Mm -hmm. So I sort of did this on my own, just watching what everybody else was saying in the chat room, and went with it. You know, I haven't heard, I, I may be out of touch, maybe the chat room can fill us in. Uh, I haven't really been reading any comments from anybody saying that they, uh, that they lost Bitcoin. Of course, we don't, they probably don't know yet because they can't log into Mount Gox and see. That's what's the problem, of course. But, um, right, but they would have received a trade confirmation email if they had. You know, really? I don't get this. Do we get this? Email. So I think if someone was getting a bunch of email reports they didn't expect, I, I'm assuming we would have heard about that by now. How do you, I don't even know about that because we're in Mount Gox uh, and I don't, do we get a trade confirmation email when we do a trade? I don't think so. Is that an option you can turn on or something? Uh, you, you have to have given them your email address when you signed up. You you're, you're able to sign up. In a, I think initially when the site was first created, it never asked for an email address at all. Mm. But if you never gave them one, I don't think you get one. We have an email address on our account and um, I don't think we've ever received a trade confirmation from them though. Maybe yeah. it's just something that they implemented with newer users or maybe it's an option that you selected somewhere I don't remember ever getting a trade confirmation I heard somebody say that too but um, I don't think we, we I mean we we've used it quite a, a bit and we never received an email confirmation so I know on, on my Gmail account they were going straight to my spam box until I started unflagging them so maybe I, honestly I, I don't know um, okay. I don't remember turning something on for that mm -hmm. but I remember going into my spam box one day and seeing all those emails and had to manually tell it not to and then from that point on I was seeing them. yeah there's a lot of speculation I've been reading in the, in the forums, you know, the, uh, all the million, <laughs> million and one conspiracy theories coming out of the woodwork. And, you know, people talk about how um, it, if the hacker had full access to the entire, um, the entire machine, obviously they wouldn't have had to do any of this. They would just withdraw all the bitcoins directly if they had access to the machine and they could control it. So obviously he must have, whoever he, she, ha uh, the hacker was, um, had full had access to the accounts and maybe was able to brute force apparently probably brute force the password and get into at least one account probably the right. one what seems to have happened and again this is this is a lot of speculation here but um according to some of the statements that mount gox has, has made a, a, an auditor who was auditing some of their books had access to their their database in a read-only fashion mm -hmm. and apparently was only supposed to be looking at certain things only <laughs> verifying some numbers to that, you know, they've been going through some efforts to try to become more legal in certain areas and be registered and that sort of thing. And mm -hmm. they were trying to have their books in order before they did that. Mm -hmm. And this auditor got their personal computer broken into in some way. So somebody broke into the auditor's computer who then <sighs> used that information to connect to the Mt. Gox server and right. was able to get a copy of every username, email address, and encrypted password. And while the passwords were encrypted, it's becoming trivial now to be able to basically just try every possible password and see which one produces the same encrypted mess that was stored in the file. Mm -hmm. And I think almost probably as a worst possible case here, using computer video cards is one of the best ways of doing that. And this group here, everyone who's doing Bitcoin mining has computers with massive numbers of video cards in them. Right. So anybody here could have launched this gigantic attack against these encrypted passwords very, mm -hmm. very quickly. Wow. Now, there, there were people, the moment it got leaked on IRC, running them through a scanner and coming up with some of the very simple passwords within seconds. Wow. That's amazing. So this, again, I'm going to repeat this to the audience. 
change your passwords. Do not ever use the same password for two things. Make sure your passwords are 16 characters long and uh, your password should look like a Bitcoin address. You understand? It should be letters, numbers, symbols, those little tilde things. You can't remember it. It's okay. Use free software like KeePassX to manage all your passwords under one locked encrypted file. And you can use it on your KeePassX has a, there's a KeePass Droid um, app that's free for your phone and you can have that file on your Dropbox, use Dropbox and you've got that. It's very convenient. You can also do it on you know, Mac, Windows and Ubuntu Linux. So there's no excuse people, you've got to have a unique password for everything. I don't care how inconvenient you might think it is. We're not talking about email anymore and spreadsheets. We're talking about money. So you've got to keep it locked up with a secure password and don't use the same password for two different things. Um, this is <laughs> something Ed and I have gone around and around about. Mm -hmm. I want a convenient password. I don't have to look it up. Well, don't be lazy. Don't be lazy. This is money here. Yeah. And look what happened. You know, it, it, you can, an investment of five or $10,000 or who knows how much can turn into a million dollars uh, or $10 million, whatever the case may be. And uh, you still have that lame little, uh, you know, password that's your uh, dog's name and your wife's anniversary. That is not cool. You're going to lose it all. Yeah. So, um, and don't ever use the same password for two things. Yeah, there's a question here for Kevin uh, from the chat room. Um, if there is a rollback, uh, if it goes through, do, do you plan on taking legal action? And if, and if so, are you afraid how legal action could affect Bitcoin's value and government involvement? That's actually a really good question. I've had so many lawyers offering to represent me in this that I have just basically told them all back off. Um, the advice I'm getting right now is to immediately file an injunction preventing Mt. Gox from doing anything because one of the things that is kind of considered a, uh, a principle of how exchanges work is once a rollback is executed and trading has resumed, you cannot do a double undo. You know, there's no going back a second time. Right. So even if I were able to, I'm not at all saying I'm going to do this, but even if I were to sue these guys, win, and say, you know, I, I won this judgment, they can't go back however long that's going to take and redo it. So I, I don't think there are, there are really many legal options I have that wouldn't completely trash the economy. Because I think even just, you know, me going, ooh, I'm going to get an injunction placed against Mt. Gox would trash the economy instantly. Everyone would pull all their money out and liquidity would fall to nothing and that would be the end of it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't It'd be one of those cases where even if I won, I would have lost because the Bitcoins would be worth nothing at that point. Right. So, yeah, I mean, you can, you can, it's kind of like uh, crossing, uh, crossing the crosswalk on green with, a, with a, a, a speeding taxi and coming the other way. You can be dead right and dead, <laughs> you know, so you yeah. can end up with all the Bitcoins in the world, but then they're worthless if the whole market is trashed. So, obviously, everyone's interest is in protecting the Bitcoin the Bitcoin you know, economy, the whole entire bit, Bitcoin itself. So at this point, okay, so we, we, we get the picture of sort of un, unfolding and evolving in front of our eyes as to what pieces are coming together about what happened here. Um, there's obviously a lot of lessons uh, for everyone involved, both customers of the exchange sites, um, ordinary people, um, buyers, sellers and all that, and the exchange sites themselves. Mt. Gox, I'm sure, has uh, about 300 things that they've learned from this, and uh, Trade Hill and all the others have too. So um, I guess the question is, now that you have explained what has happened and, and your, your point of view and your situation and, what, and all that, what would you ask Mt. Gox to do? What would you have them do? To be honest, first I would like some more transparency in what's going on. You know, one of the things that really bugged me is that within minutes of, of Mark logging on to IRC and, and seeing what happened, one of his first reactions was to say, we're rolling it all back, mm -hmm. which seemed to me like a very abrupt decision that happened before there was really enough evidence to say what was going on. So I'd like to kind of know how they came to this decision and really what happened, because he's, he's telling a lot of people, basically, you know, if we look at the total amount of money that was sold, that's roughly $10 million that was spread across, you know, 100 people. Mm, he's asking right. all those people to give that up without really telling them why they're doing that. You know, he's right. saying it's a stolen account. He hasn't really 
come forward with any of it, and I completely understand he's got he's got things to do right now. You yeah. know, he's pretty busy. Um, and mm -hmm. I've been trying really hard to let him have some space to do that before I'm all over him going, hey, w what about me? What about me? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think the longer that the exchange is down, the worse things are going to be for everybody. So until things, you know, until he's get to the point where okay, we're going to get things back up now. That's when I want to talk to him about what's going on. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this brings up a, you know, we've talked about this before, but it brings up a good question as far as like a free open source uh, exchange software software as opposed to a proprietary. And will that, I, I, I might show my ignorance here, but it, would that help any at all, do you think, if, if we had more um, of a free open transparency type of software? I, th I think that would, that would be a first step. I think still, no matter what, as long as there's somebody who's running it who feels that they can go in and manually change the database to undo something they didn't agree with, that's still a problem, you know? Right. And I think that's really counter towards how Bitcoin works. You know, if I give you Bitcoins, there is nothing I can do to undo that later, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that's, we need to come up with some kind of exchange system where the exchange works under similar principles, you know? It's all cryptographically signed, it's all, you know, mathematically proven that once something's done, it's not undone. Um, mm -hmm. To at least make me feel more secure about this, because I, it, this kind of shakes my face a lot of things, you know? Yeah. Phew. So, <laughs> I mean, in general, do you, okay, if you were running an exchange site, would you, um, I, I know that you're saying that if, if you are going to do rollbacks, then you should announce that that is a possibility. If you were running an exchange site, would you uh, post that rollbacks are a possibility and under what conditions would you um, say that rollbacks should, should happen? I am, I am not opposed to the idea of rollbacks at all, actually. You know, if I were running a site like this, I would, I would probably very clearly have something. But at the same time, I don't know if I would have my rollback policy to include something where if the exchange was partially or fully at fault, that I wouldn't cover those, those trades. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's going to be really hard for Mt. Gox to later say that they had no responsibility in this happening whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that's kind of where, where I, I would be in that situation. I, I would probably allow rollbacks, but with some very, very clear policies up front. And how, like... Uh, <laughs> Like what would what would the policies be though? Like I mean, well, two things, two two parts to this question, I guess. What would under what conditions? Are there, would there be a certain type of condition that you would want that you would uh, say rollbacks would be necessary? And also, do you really think that it's Mt. Gox's um, responsibility if they if there's a any kind of a flaw in the system or the system is hacked or whatever? I mean, they're a victim. Obviously, Mt. Gox is also a victim of the hacker as as much as any more than anybody probably. And um, sh do you think that Mt. Gox should be liable financially to make up for those losses out of their own pockets? Again, I'm, I'm really torn on this because I, I really think Mark is a good guy. I don't think he's being malicious here. I don't want to see anything bad happen to him. But on the other side of that coin, they are the only ones who are really able to pursue anything against this auditor to try to recover damages for it. You know, mm -hmm. this is someone who apparently was claiming to be some kind of professional at this. Mm -hmm. who was responsible for all this. They are the only person who could go after their liability insurance to get things reimbursed. We can't do that. Mm -hmm. So if for some reasons there, I think they're responsible for that alone. And others, you know, people had been telling them for days there was a password problem and they kept reassuring everybody that everything was okay. I mm -hmm. still changed my password anyway, but, you know, to, for them to continually reassure the public that their, their exchange is secure and then later to be proved that it's not, and they probably should have known that it wasn't, it's really hard for me to feel like they shouldn't have some liability in this. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> some liability in this uh, versus covering it all is the question. Obviously, there's, there's so many issues because it is unregulated. There's not, uh, there's not a government uh, you know, FDIC that's backing this, which is a good thing. That's a feature, not a bug. We all agree. However, um, you know, it is the wild, wild west in a way. I mean, anybody can set up a bank, basically. Anybody can set up a Bitcoin bank. You can set up your own mybitcoin.com or your own exchange site. Right. And for all of you who are thinking about starting your own exchange site, li listen to this, <laughs> pay attention and learn because it's more than just a computer and a code. You gotta have the, uh, you gotta have the, the wherewithal to secure it and also to withstand a lot of stress because 
I always, I always tell Ed that one thing I do not want to be involved with is uh, OPM, other people's money. Mm -hmm. Because when you're, when you're managing other people's money, man, you are on the hook. Right. You know, if you lose other people's money, they will come after you. Right. And I really feel for Mark in this situation, obviously. I mean, because um, he's, you know, Jed who founded Mt. Gox and Mark who now has taken it over are uh, phenomenal guys. And they are, um, you know, they're, they're doing a great, great thing. Everybody has to agree. What Mt. Gox has yes. done for Bitcoin is uh, really beyond compare. They, what they've made it strong. Mt. Gox is the price. When you want to know what's a bit, what a Bitcoin's worth, it's Mt. Gox. So what they've contributed to the Bitcoin community, we have to keep that in perspective. That um, it, it, they're they're volunteers, just like all of us. We're, they're doing more than than probably any of us watching. Um, so. The fact that we put all of our, uh, it is centralized to a certain extent, but we're putting all of this burden and stress on them. They're coders, they're programmers, you know? They're doing the best they can with what they've got, or at least, <coughs> at least we hope they are. <laughs> but uh, basically, they're holding on to other people's money, and uh, it's a very risky, dangerous game. So you really got to think it through. It's got to be a careful, careful, uh, thought out process. And so we're going to be we're doing a video in the next yeah, 10 few days. PM, 10 p well, yeah, 10 p.m. Eastern time, we're going to have Mark himself from Mount Gox Live, who's going to answer all of your questions from the chat room. And yeah, in the next couple of days, we're going to be doing a how-to video, so watch for that too on OnlyOneTV.com. A how-to video, how to uh, back up and secure your Bitcoins yourself on your own machine absolutely securely. So we're out of time. We're, we are out of time. So uh, come back and watch again at 10 p.m. Eastern time or 2 a.m. tomorrow uh, GMT. And uh, we'll have Mark from uh, Mount Gox here live to join us. And thank you very much, Kevin, for thanks joining us Kevin. and telling your story. And thanks to our sponsors who are providing this great show for you guys. Absolutely. So till 10 o'clock, we'll see you then. All right. Thanks for thank joining you. us.